Jupiter Broadcasting presents this program in stereo. And welcome, welcome to the Linux Action Show. Uh Uh-oh, I forgot the number. But it's episode 168, season 17, episode 8. My name is Chris, and say hi there, Alan. Hey. Hey there, Alan. In the morning to you. (laughs) Welcome to the Linux Action Show. Now, of course, you're filling in for Brian because the B-Man's in California this week, and uh, he wasn't able to join us. We were going to try to hook it up, but the tech just didn't work out and the timing didn't work out. So we thought instead of doing a full regular show this week, uh, we'd throw in something a little different, a Summer Express edition of the Linux Action Show. And this episode, we're going to take a look at converting a USB thumb drive into a Linux Live CD, essentially. You know how you can download the Ubuntu Live CD and all these things, but you always have to burn a live disk or a DVD, something like that, in order to get it working. But why not use some of that USB media you've got laying around? So we'll cover that with Unet Booten uh, in the second segment. Plus, we're going to uh, mix in some news in there. Alan's gone out and uh, done the news collection for this week and uh, put it all in the dock. So uh, we'll go through that. So we've got kind of a more uh, compact express edition of the show, but uh, I think we're going to have fun nonetheless. Right. Now, Alan, I've got, a pretty, I've got probably one of my most all-time treasured Android picks. But before we get to that, I want to talk about something else that is truly treasured, and that's GoDaddy.com. And uh, GoDaddy.com, of course, has sponsored Linux Action Show now for years. And if you use our promo code Linux, you can save 10% when you check out over at GoDaddy or Linux20 to save 20% off shared hosting. Of course, you could do all of those things, but I might even have a, a better deal here. Now, uh, if the B-Man right, was here... I did. Uh, I, I know. I just used the Linux Action Code coupon this week. To buy I know, but see, here's the thing. is, If you want to do a .co domain, I have an even better... You were going for oh. a .com, right? Yes. Yeah. Now, this is for .co's, and I was thinking about, like... The .co domain, and what would I use a .co for? And I thought it would be an interesting way to sort of integrate it with a project name, like a messaging yep. platform or something like that. Anything .co would sound kind of catchy yeah. and sort of All stick in the of, brain. You know, those domain hacks where, you know, the last, if you name your things the last two letters .co, then you break it up, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So then I was thinking, okay, maybe I could play with this a little bit. Um, and you can get a .co domain for thirteen ninety nine at uh, checkout if you use our temporary promo code Linux thirteen. And that's only good until July 31st of 2011. And that's Linux 1399 to get uh, a .co domain for 1399. So there you go. Right? Thanks, yes, GoDaddy. Yes, now the Linux Action Co. <laughs> yeah, the Linux Action .co, right? Okay. Yes. So that's, uh, that's, that's GoDaddy, and I want to say thanks to them. But now I have got the Android pick that will really help you get organized if you are a quick note taker it's called mm-hmm. i don't know if i'm gonna get this right epsil what do you think alan it's e-p-i-s-t-l-e yeah, epsil? Something, like that. something like that and it is a really clean simple to use note taking application that really gets out of your way is super fast and um, also syncs with dropbox if you're a dropbox user uh. the other thing that's really nice about it is if you're a markdown user it also supports oh. Markdown with Live Preview, which is kind of nice. Yes, because we so you, use Markdown for the show notes now. Yep, yep. So you can just chat away into this. And you can just type away in your Markdown script and things like that, and it will Live Preview it in, uh, in HTML. And then uh, in, the re- in real time, in just a standard text file, sync it to your Dropbox in the background. So then you can sit down at your desktop, and uh, boom, Bob's your uncle. You can get to all the notes that you created and on the go. Uh, on a phone, is definitely a place where the shorthand way of formatting stuff in yeah. Markdown would yeah just multiply its usefulness. And I find that apps like this are even better on the slightly larger Galaxy Tab. Like that, to me, is even where yep. this shines a little, a little brighter. Especially if you can have the full keyboard that lets you make things like the, the star and the asterisk and the, and the hash mark easier. Yeah, yeah. Like on my phone, I have the choice of a couple of keyboards, and I use the one that has everything because I'm used to that. But that means I have to use the stylus rather than my finger because the buttons are so small. Uh, pure... Peer guy in the chat room says it's epistle. Uh, I don't think that's it either. I don't. I don't think so. But uh, maybe it is. I don't know. I don't want to call him out on that. But I think he's trying too hard. <laughs> so uh, link to the show note. Link in the show notes for this app. It's totally free, and of course, it's got a uh, it's got a great rating on uh, AppBrain, which um, 
I, I just completely concur with this. One of my favorite note taking applications of all time. And the whole uh, the whole nice thing about it, like for us, is uh, I can I can create a document on a computer, and then I could be like I was thinking like on the go or a little here at the here at here at the table. I could have my Galaxy Tab with me and pull up the Markdown stuff right here and just view it as we're going. I could have like a little notes yep. machine with me. So I'm, exactly. that's really cool. It, so, you know, a combination notes slash teleprompter. <laughs> Yeah, it could be. A, it could also be a little quick, uh, a little quick teleprompter. So that's the Android pick for this week, Ipsol or something like that. Anyways, link in the show notes to go check that out. All right, Alan, what do you say we go over and uh, start looking at Unet Booten? You ready? For sure. All right, now this segment is going to be a little bit of the news and a little bit of Unet Booten. We're going to combine the two things because, like I mentioned earlier, this is the Summer Express Edition of the Linux Action Show. We're playing loose and fancy free with the format since the B-Man's out. We're just going to have a good time and just kind of do a one-off show. And when he gets back next week, if everything goes as planned, we'll be back to our traditional Linux Action Show format goodness. Now, uh, in this segment, Alan, you've lined up some news stories, and so while we chat about those news stories, I'm going to also kind of uh, butt in from time to time and give people a progress update on uh, my uh, little uh, little mini project here for UNET Bootin. Now, for those of you who are watching the video version, you're going to get a little extra bonus because here on this screen, I've got uh, a live video stream of my efforts of setting up UNET Booting and partitioning my thumb drive and all that kind of stuff, all of which I will try to also uh, go along with the audio stream as we go and all those kinds of good things. You know, Alan, I should probably give the background. Now, you know some of the background on this project, right? A little bit, yep. Yeah, because on, on our other popular Jupiter Broadcasting production tech snap... Um, Alan and I covered uh, Bitcoin in our, what was that, our 10th episode? I think so, yeah. That inspired me to figure out a way to build a system that could mine at a relatively low price point with, li with as little thermal and um, noise output as possible because I'm mining out in my garage where I also record these shows, so I can't have a lot of fan noise. And uh, also... I wanted something that would just sort of let me scratch my Linux itch because I'm finding this Bitcoin mining to be a great way to play with Linux and, and do mm -hmm. some distributed Linux computing and things like that. So it's, it's been a good opportunity. So I set out and I got myself an, an Atom motherboard with a, no heat sink. It's just a passive well, cooling. Well, it has a heat sink but no fan. Oh, right. Yeah, it has a heat sink but it has no passive fan cooling. on that heat sink. And it's just passive cooling and it's a nice little rig. In fact, I included some pictures in the show notes if you guys want to go check them out. I'll... I'll pull them, pull them up here in a yeah, sec. Yeah, it's but, a uh, pretty nice looking rig. Yeah, and I put like a Radeon 5830 uh, on there, I think, which, which was, was uh, I guess, the, they call it the reference model, so you can get a little more uh, a little more head, headroom and overclocking. I got that thing up to yep. 875 megahertz just on the, nice. on the one thing. So uh, if you're watching the video version here, I'll show you a quick picture of my, uh, my um, little mini ATX uh, Atom board. And the whole design principle behind this thing is I wanted it to run Linux, I wanted it to be caseless, and I wanted it to be quiet and super easy, and no moving parts as much as possible. Now, the GPU fan obviously has has moving parts because it's got right. it's got to cool that monster in there. Um, but the rest of the machine, with with only the exception of the power supply, has no moving parts. And I accomplished this through using a USB bootable drive. And I wanted to cover how I did that. It boots up into Linux off a thumb drive. I don't have to have any a hard spinning drive media on there, no live CD, anything. I did start with a live CD, but then I decided to go from live CD to a, uh, yep. to a thumb drive. So that's that, and uh, that's pretty cool, and I also included a shot of my overall mining setup in the show notes. Um, but, so that was sort of the genesis of this. And then believe it or not, Alan, uh, I've heard of UNEP booting over the years a few times, but the person that turned me on to it was my grandpa. Yeah, he just over the last few years have gotten kind of into uh, Linux live CDs and said, "You got to, Christopher, you've got to check out UNet Booten." I thought, "All right, Grandpa." So that's what we're going to do in this episode. We're going to look at UNet Booten while we chat about the news stories too. And Alan, there's a few stories on the news docket this week that uh, yep. kind of seemed like they were trying to grab the attention of headlines. We'll we will cover that one in a bit. But why don't we start out with this uh, Debbie Debian 7.0 news? Yeah, well, I think this one's a little bit of the same thing. Yeah, uh, yeah, but. Apparently for Debian 7.0, uh, Wheezy, they're going to include the option of using the GNU herd kernel, which if people know their Linux history, originally that was supposed to be the kernel for right? the GNU user land that basically comes with every Linux uh, distribution was originally meant to have its own kernel and be a separate operating system. But then at some point, you know, they came up with the Linux kernel, which had no user land, and they just made it the two. This seems like one of these promises that we've had now for, 
I don't know. Like 20 years. Yeah, it's just like, but now they're actually putting a date to it. Is that what the big deal is? Or there's yeah. just a so date range? The, yeah, so uh, late 2012, early 2013, there will actually be a GNU herd kernel uh, version of Debian that you can use. Well, there you go. If you want to. I'm uh, sure everybody will be jumping all Debian over that. Debian has a bit of a history with this. They also have a BSD kernel that you can run with the GNU user land. And that's already fairly stable. And you can do pretty why much would everything you, with it. Why would you do that? Because the BSD kernel is better. Oh, snaps, Alan, snaps. I, well. uh, they, uh, actually, there's a bunch of uh, benchmarks they did with this. Uh, it's called like K-free BSD or something like that. And it looks there's some interesting numbers in there. Uh, does it, is it actually pretty good performance-wise? Uh, yeah. Dang you, sir. Dang you and your and your. Well, specifically, kernel. the BSD kernel was uh, about five or six, I guess, maybe even more than six years ago now. Uh, they decided to rewrite the kernel from the ground up with this whole idea of huge parallel computing. Ah, I so remember that effort. I remember before that. Before even multi-core actually came right. out, they kind of predicted that's where things were going, and they rewrote the whole kernel to take advantage of that. Now, we should give people a disclaimer that Alan is, uh, well, first of all, you guys should watch TechSnap if you don't know, or go back yes, and watch our Brothers TechSnap. in Arm episodes of uh, the Linux Action Show. But Alan is, uh, runs, a, runs a system called Scale Engine and uh, hosts a lot of our stuff, including our main site, and it, uh, mm -hmm. pretty much all the underpinning is, is FreeBSD, right? Yeah, everything is FreeBSD. We have one Linux box in the whole company, and that's actually for Bitcoin mining. <laughs> I was gonna. I was wondering if you were gonna call that out or not. Yeah. So yeah, and is that that's a Mint box or is that an Ubuntu box? What is that? Uh, it's just Ubuntu because uh, ATI doesn't make drivers for BSD. Uh, but yeah. Nvidia yeah. does. Yeah. Nvidia has high quality proprietary drivers for BSD, but uh, not necessarily the best for Bitcoin mining. So you gotta yep. go ATI. So I, I have one Ubuntu box. Now, uh, before we go on to the next story, I'll, I'll set up what, ha, where, how I got this started. Now, link's in the show notes, but it, the project is called Unet Bootin, and I, hopefully I'm saying that right. It's kind of obnoxious if I'm not. And uh, you can probably, with a good chance, find it in your distro's repo. It's what, what I did here on Mint 11. It's just in the repo, and you just app get install it. Um, and once you have it installed, it's pretty straightforward to uh, set up. You, uh, you need to get an ISO. If you don't have an ISO, it will download one for you. But one of the first things I believe you need to do, and I could be wrong because I'm kind of new into all this because I normally just burn CDs, but you're going to need to uh, format your thumb drive in FAT32 and partition it with a nice one file, a uh, one partition, FAT32, and then flash it. And uh, so I will cover how you do that and what tool I recommend, especially if you just want to stay gooey the entire time uh, after our next story. And the next story is... CentOS 6.0 is finally released. Dun da da da. Well, because uh, but Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6 has been out for a while now, right? Yeah, and do you remember actually one of the last times you were on the show, we covered that story about Red Hat sort of changed the way they packaged up their kernel source code to mm -hmm. theoretically potentially make it more difficult for CentOS. Do you remember that? Well, I think it was it wasn't for CentOS specifically, but for all the other ones that More are... More for, like, unbreakable Oracle Linux, really. Yeah, and yeah, things like that. Yeah. But, yeah. but it might have... I would, I would assume it would have some effect on CentOS as well. Probably. Yeah. Um, so this is, an interesting, this is an interesting release, mainly because it is putting them in now feature parity with, like, what you mentioned, the version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux that's already out. And the, right, and that's what CentOS is supposed to be. It's Red Hat Enterprise Linux without the pay support. And that, a few features. It's, it's beautiful, because even if you're a shop that still ends up using Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and a lot of places do, just so they have that name and they have that support mm -hmm. contract, but it can get extremely expensive to scale that you know, into like a testing right. environment. Maybe not so much for like actual production quality testing, but like back in the uh, administrator's offices where they need to try out something new on the new version of Red Hat... It's yeah. a great platform for that, and it's a great and platform it, for hosting. Right, and it works almost the same. Like it's, it's like completely compatible, so you can like intermix them. Yeah, and, and, and your, your environment ends up still being heterogeneous. Everything's the same, yeah. but what we would do, what we would do at the bank I worked for is um, we had applications that would require an enterprise version of Linux, like Tivoli and things like that, and they would. Tivoli Enterprise Backup would either ha you'd have to have Enterprise Red Hat Linux or SUSE Enterprise Linux, 
And one of the great things you could do, though, is you could have CentOS in there, and Tivoli would have no idea it wasn't standard, full-fledged Red Hat. So if you had, like, right. you know, your secondary DNS server for your LAN, you don't really need to buy a $1,500 Red Hat support license for that because it could be off for a week and you wouldn't even notice. But Tivoli, exactly. you might still want it to be backed up for your overall change management infrastructure and things like that. Tivoli would yep. go on there, no problem. I mean, it's, a, it's really nice for that. Exactly. Now, uh, so the why don't we talk a little bit about the partitioning? Because I think that's one part that is most applicable to anybody, even if you're not doing something like a bootable USB thumbstick, is you might just want to partition your drives. I really like, even if you're a QT person on KDE, I really like Gparted. I know there's alternatives yes. out there, but Gparted is just awesome. Their live CD is like 11 megabytes. Yeah, and it's also on the uh, System Rescue CD, which is pretty, it's like it's really small as well. And you, you can. Yep. Uh, so what I'm going to do is. I'm going to go ahead. I've already inserted my USB thumb drive in uh, Gparted. I can select my thumb drive from the drop-down list, and then it's really just pretty straightforward. I can just delete it and add a new FAT32 partition. I mean, it's click, click, you're good to go. And I, I love this app. So this is my solution to making just a simple, flat, one partition FAT32 uh, USB th uh, on, the, on the USB thumb drive before I use UNet boot. Yep. So I really like that. You could do it. In fact, the chat room is giving out uh, suggestions in there and the ways you could do it on the command line. But uh, I don't know. Yeah, I know. They're saying use FDisk. I know, I know. But I really but, like Gparted. Yeah, even I have used Gparted a lot. It's, it's nice. Even for like resizing NTFS partitions and stuff. Well, oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, and, and that used to be something I wouldn't normally be like, oh, yeah, totally. But no, it is completely safe. I've never had an issue, and I've used yep. it for years. And the, and well, the really nice... Specifically, uh, Windows never partitions how I want. So I usually <laughs> set up the partitions how I want them first, and then run the Windows installer and say, put it on that one. Surprise, surprise, right? Well, what I, yep. so the, the two things that I like a lot about it, and, and one is when you're dealing with a lot of partitions, it is just nice to graphically lay them out so you can kind of just keep a good, close eye on what you're doing. But the yes. other thing it lets you do is it lets you queue up your changes before you execute them. So you can do a series of changes, see how those will look like on the disk layout and things like that, exactly. and then once you're happy with it, you can hit the apply button and it just goes ahead and executes that. And that, yep. that's one of my favorite things about it. So there we go. So while we were chatting... I just partitioned it to FAT32 and then formatted it, and so now I'm ready to go use UNetboot. So yep. that'll be the next thing. Now, uh, before we do that, we were talking about stories that seem to be written just to grab headlines, and I think this story, al along with the uh, heard one, but I think definitely this story uh, takes that award for this week, and that is Microsoft dun -da -da -dun, is one of the top contributors to the 3.0 version of the Linux kernel. What? Yeah. Uh, specifically, the most active, the developer who made the most changes works for yeah. Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, and Microsoft was the seventh uh, biggest company to commit changes. Uh, but about 95% of all of their changes were this one guy. Uh, <laughs> but if, if oh, you read no. down, it turns out that what he was committing to the kernel was uh, Hyper-V support. Mm -hmm. So a bunch of stuff to make it work properly in Hyper-V. Yeah. No, you know, Microsoft has every interest in the world to make Linux run great under Windows virtualization, under virtualization right. under Windows. Exactly. That, that's exactly where they want your Linux usage to be, so of course they're going to do right. that. Right, because, you know, especially that way, because then that sells their Hyper-V licenses, because otherwise you end up with people being like, well, you know, if we use the commercial version of, if we use VMware or uh, VirtualBox, we can run the Windows machines inside there right. and have no issues. Right, yeah. Well, you, you can keep your infrastructure on Windows. Yeah. But for those one-off small things that you need that Linux operating system for, virtualize it in Microsoft Hyper-V. Now with improved Linux kernel support, thanks to Microsoft's active development to the Linux 3.0 kernel. Now Linux runs better than ever on your Windows 2008 R2 Hyper-V server. You know, that's mm -hmm. what they're doing it for. Exactly. So they can say that right there. Exactly. Uh, so there you have it. All right, so... Um, now I'm on to my next stage. Now, for those of you who have, are familiar with UNetBoot and you know about this lovely little feature, if you, if you don't even have the ISO downloaded yet and you just know you want to go run some version of Linux, it will automatically go out and fetch the ISO and then write it for you for a ton of distros. Everything from Arch Linux to Backtrack, which is awesome, by the way. People keep asking me. I mean, I'm, I'm going to do an episode on Backtrack, either on TechSnap or this show at some point. Everything, everything from Arch to Ubuntu is automatically in this list. It will actually go get the ISO for you, including System Rescue CD, which is probably what the most of you out there are going to want to do this. Just if you've got a thumb drive sitting around in your desk after this episode, 
grab it, get UNAP booting, and put System Rescue CD on there. It will be beneficial to you at some point in the future. It is a great little yep. recovery, repair. does NTFS repairs, too, if you've got a Windows box that gets messed up. It's a great little tool, so it's worth it just for this. But in this, in, in this scenario, because what I am downloading is not in their list, I'm going to do uh, Linux Coin. Linux Coin is a live CD for Bitcoin mining. It has all of the ATI drivers and OpenCL stuff already set up. And that's what I'm using to do my stuff on. So you can go select that ISO image and then write it. And I'll do that after the next news story. What do you think about that, Alan? Uh, Linux Coin, uh, which distro is it based on? Linux Coin is based on Debian testing. And because um, uh, ATI has recently re released newer drivers that offer like a three or four percent performance increase. Yeah. You might. And uh, they have manual instructions for installing it under Debian, which should work Ooh. fine on Linux Coin. Oh, nice. Well, another reason to then get it off of a live CD and put it on a USB media. Yeah, because um, then you can make small changes like that. I noticed and, that they're using like one rev older of the ATI SDK, which I guess is supposedly has better performance. I don't... Yeah. We, no. I, it took me a little while to play around with every version of the ATI drivers and every version of the stream SDK and then a couple of versions of the... Python, OpenCL, Bitcoin Miner yes. to get the best performance. Yeah, and once you kind of, it is, it it has been a source of, I mean, it's got you a BSD guy running, you you're running Linux to do it. I mean, it's a great yeah. Linux enthusiast little hobby. I mean, it's, yep. I don't know if it's going to make any money ever, but uh, it's definitely right. a good little Linux hobby. Why don't we uh, talking what, about that? Uh, the open source ATI drivers are yeah. finally coming along quite well. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Gallium 3D drivers now have 60 to 70 percent of the performance of the proprietary drivers. That's getting serious, and so yes. that's getting to the point now where if you mostly just use your desktop for like web and email to, or you know any 2D stuff, but you just need occasional yep. performance. And you want 3D, or yeah, you want performance for you know playing back video in Flash or playing a couple of games and, and that kind of thing. You can actually, it, the performance is now pretty much usable. Yeah, yeah, and actually speaking of Flash. That kind of dovetails in with the next story really well, so we might as well talk about it, is 64-bit uh, yep. Flash for Linux makes a return. And this, this had yes. a few people so, surprised. Uh, Adobe uh, just released Flash Player 11 uh, as beta for all the platforms, and that includes a 64-bit version for Linux. So if you have you know 64-bit native browser and everything, you can actually use 64-bit Flash now as well. Very nice. That is cool. Mm -hmm. That is really great. I mean, and it's good to Flash see them Flash, but after they killed uh, Flash support for the Air platform, it was nice to see them actually live up to the promise and have 64-bit Flash for Linux. Exactly. I, I honestly, once they killed Air, I figured, okay, well, all the other promises regarding Linux are just going to go with yeah. that as well. Um, I guess, uh, I guess the uh, brother Lou in the chat room says that the Blender has been um, tested and maybe even optimized. He says it works really well with the open source drivers, so that. You know, is an interesting area where you could really see things come together on the Linux desktop where when these open source drivers get to a certain performance point and then open source applications can work together to really work well with those drivers, then we can start seeing some serious dividends be paid on all of the work going into open source and this stuff. And then you really exactly. will see a well, strong case for that. That's what happens with the proprietary drivers in the games, right? They work together to optimize the game to work well for the drivers. Yeah, and a lot Nvidia. of times you'll see that is... You know, after a game comes out, the next couple of revs of the drivers will include changes in their change notes saying, like, you know, this game is now 10% faster. Yep, yep. You're right. Yeah, see, and now, now we can start doing that on our own, although we don't have to go through some sort of partner licensing program with NDAs yeah. and, and IP well, restrictions, exactly. which then prevents you from open sourcing your own stuff. Yep. We just go exactly. get the code. That's going to be really awesome. All right, um... UNAP booting, back to this. Now, from this point, it's really quite super easy. Uh, I've selected my ISO image from my downloads folder, and uh, this you, your mileage may vary, but you're not going to believe this, folks. Once you select a uh, type as USB drive, and uh, you select your USB drive like I have done, you can put in some kernel options if you want to, but uh, once you start going... Oh, of course, I don't have it mounted. But once you start copying here, it actually just starts writing it to the file system and even makes it bootable. So... I I have probably realized after using UNet booting that I must have wasted forty blank CDs in the last year. Yeah. When I could have been just using this the entire time. Uh, so yeah. that's that's what. Uh, what are you gonna do, right? I had uh, a couple. I bought a couple of like rewritable CDs for that, but I yeah. basically worn them all out. 
and they tend to get misplaced or scratched yeah. really bad when you, you're using them to build new systems all the time. Yeah. It, they just they don't stand up to the beating where a little USB thumb drive does. And, the and nice it lets you rewrite it how many thousands of times. Again. And the nice thing is it's, it is noticeably faster than the, yes. than the live CD. Especially uh, when, like, CDs are worse for seeking. As soon as you start seeking on the CD, it just makes it horrible. Yeah, you know, you like uh, when you're on the command line and uh, you go to hit, like, tab completion sometimes and the command you're going to tab... search through a bunch of commands and it takes forever. <laughs> I, yeah. And I always sit there and go, why did I do that, dummy? I knew better than that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I... I, I yeah. Uh, we actually, when I used to work at the power plant when we were doing the Windows 2000 migration from Windows NT, oh, yeah. uh, one of the things we did to actually make the install faster was we made our own uh, bootable CD that had the contents of the Windows 2000 CD in a zip file. Yeah, oh yeah. And then, it then it would extract it to the hard drive and install it from there. And, yep. Because yep. reading that one solid zip file off the CD was like five times faster than reading the individual files off the CD. Uh, now, uh, Condaloo uh, in the chat room says that he has an issue with the flash drives that he uses where sometimes the controllers give out and thus the flash media is unusable. So it doesn't really end up being economical. One thing to note is it doesn't have to be a, a, you know, a thumb drive. It could be like a, if you have an old external USB hard drive, spinning hard drive, you could use that as well, which would probably be even faster, I would think. Um, the USB media is handy for me just because I happen to have a bunch of it. So, okay, I mounted it, and uh, it is now copying over the UNet booting, and it just goes from the ISO image to the USB media, and it's, once it's done, it's bootable, and now I have a live USB media using Gparted nice. and UNet booting with links to all of everything you'll need in the show notes. So there you go. Alan, yeah, uh, I did something similar when I installed the BSD on my netbook. I used the SD card slot. Yes, I, I love that my Triple E has a internal storage and an SD card slot because yep. that's, that's super handy. We've got one last news story here about Ubuntu yes. and uh, long-term support issues. Do you want to cover that one before we wrap? Yeah, sure. I was just uh, reading, and uh, somebody from the University of Toronto was uh, blogging and said they use uh, the long-term support version of Ubuntu 10.8 or something like that. 10.04. Okay. 10.04, 10 10 yeah. And uh, so then there's a bunch of vulnerabilities come out, and uh, those get patched or whatever. Uh, and they announce changes for all the new versions of uh, all the currently supported distributions, but they missed uh, 10.04 long-term support. Oh, no. So like just by mistake. When, when, when the security notices come out and they're not for the version you run, you mostly ignore them, right? Sure. There's nothing for you to do. They don't apply to you. A and then they announce uh, update, updated kernels for specialized versions of 10.04, like the ones for Amazon EC2. Yes, but right. Again, that's not what I'm using, so I ignore it. And then after a while, you realize they've never patched that vulnerability for 10.04 yet. Oh, no. And uh, finally, they make a patch for it but they never send out the security announcement, so nobody knows to go and get it. A lot of people monitor. You can subscribe to, like, uh, one of the things I've done, too, in the past is used uh, U, uh, Yahoo Pipes, and I will subscribe to RSS feeds for security bulletins to only the operating systems my environments use. And exactly. I can use, U, uh, U, uh, I used to, I haven't done this for a long time, but I used to be able to use Yahoo Pipes to sort of filter that out. So, yeah, if they didn't make an announcement, I would have to go check the, which I do, but I would have to be checking right. the updater manually myself. Exactly. And um, specifically, if you're running uh, a big production system, you don't have the automatic updating turned on because you don't want your machine rebooting. You, you, you want oh, yeah. to like control server, so. everything that gets updated, right? Yeah. yeah. Especially, and that's the whole point of this long-term support version is that they're supposed to keep up with it. And yeah. uh, it took the, they finally issued the announcement so that people with 10.04 would see it and do the update, but it was not handled very well. See, I think, I don't know, this is, this is you know... Maybe an edge case scenario. We can't really condemn yep. Canonical for for a mistake like that. Right. But it, I have been going as the show has been going on this last season. I've been sort of collecting these pieces of news that I keep going back and questioning. Uh, sort of like the former CEO or CTO, I forget who left uh, Ubuntu or Canonical recently was expressing concern over. Is it seems like sometimes Canonical gets distracted, and I don't know how how that really comes through other than through things like this, like exactly. sort of misstepping on that. And it could just also just speak to the fact that maybe processes aren't in place yet that need to be in place. I don't know yeah. what it is, but as it, an IT it administrator... Like, yeah, that they're, they're focused on where they're going, and they're like, well, these 10.04 people, are, they're 
they're, way behind I guess, and they're holding it back. But when you, when, you, is, when you make that long-term support version, you promise that you're supporting it for two years. Well, and 1004 is just October of 2010. I mean, it, that's not even a year ago, yeah, right. right? So that's not that long ago. I don't understand, yeah. really. It's not. doesn't seem like it doesn't... It, that's a... a yeah, you know, four or five years would not be unusual for a server operating system. I mean, Red Hat, Red, if yep. you look at Red Hat's long-term support, it's it's years and years and now. And if you look at the fact that uh, April of 2010, right, because the fourth month, so it's April yep. of 2010. So it's over a year ago, but it's not. Again, for a server, you know, you're talking maybe a four or five year lifespan before you even reload the operating system, depending on what it's doing. Exactly. Um, and and yeah, I, if you have a lot of servers, uh, you're going to you you have to go through sort of a standards procedure. Again, this yep. is funny. I don't and mean to keep bringing this up. Honestly, but that's one of the things the BSD project does very well. Is they have like these security committees and who has a head and you know they make it's their job to just well, deal with long term support and these security advisors. Yeah, yeah. The BS free BSD of course does it well. I mean they have a, it's it's very inherent to the to the structure yeah. of of the free BSD project. But yeah. also so so does Red Hat and Novell, right? Yeah, and exactly. uh, and the and a lot of the other vendors. But maybe it's there's a difference when probably ninety five percent of your bread is buttered from your server butter. You know. Yep. Everybody's stroking that bread is is a server administrator, so you make sure that they have the best butter ever. Do you know what I'm getting at? Whereas yes, uh, when you're kind of like you're you're a desktop you're a desktop distro, but you're also this cloud stuff, and you're also this netbook uh, OS designer guy, and you're also this new desktop interface company, right. and you're you're also this cl- app in the cloud. I mean, it's just all over the place. Yeah, and I guess to them that most of the users have the automatic updating on, and it's it's not quite the same. Well, but not on servers though. Not not on servers. No. Not on long term support right. yeah exactly so uh, my unit my uh should we re- should, well you won't be able to see it if yep. i reboot dang i was gonna say i'll reboot and well here i'll try it and you'll just have to take my word for it i'm gonna reboot while we yep. chat and we'll see if uh my uh, new thumbstick works all right i'm yep. doing it now the restart has happened so i think i've got to say i think really this is just going to wrap up the summer express edition of the linux action show we were just we wanted to get something out and b-man was down in california and we still wanted to do a show for you guys so uh, alan was kind enough to uh join me now alan you're normally uh on the on the uh, stream with me on Thursdays at 1 p.m. Yes. Pacific for uh, TechSnap. Yes, we do TechSnap uh, quite a bit earlier in the afternoon. Yeah, uh, for, well, for compared to most of your nightly shows. But right. I guess it's later than your Linux Action show. All right, here it goes. So now, okay, so what comes up, I wish I could show you guys. What it comes up with is um, a very simple grub menu. And on there it has, as one of the options now, um, Linux coin. And uh, I can now I can choose that Linux coin option, and it will begin booting off of the thumb drive, and it works great. And in fact, Linux coin even offers a persistent mode in case you want to flash it to a thumb drive, which is really nice. If if the distro you use kind of takes that into consideration, it can make it an even better experience. So there you go. I am now uh, running that live Linux coin CD off of my flash media, all while we did the show. Alan, easy peasy, yes. right? Okay. I just got I just got to ask when you were holding that up, I saw a reflection. Did I see an Elcars menu? Um, maybe, maybe. <laughs> I don't know what that would have been of, but uh, oh. I kind That's of dream. I, I kind of dream L cars, so it could just work its way subconsciously into the into the design of the studio. Right, I dream in L cars, and I, I and Major Roddenberry's sweet, sweet voice, Alan. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Now the Linux Action Show is live on Sundays at 10 a.m. Pacific over at jblive.tv, and usually we release later on in the evening in just about any dang format you would ever want. I cannot believe how much faster this is. Compared to the live city, it is so great, oh, yes. um, and including uh, audio only, including high def- definition video, including mobile video that works great on Androids or iPods, and all of the RSS fe- feeds for those things. Along with this episode, show notes are over at JupiterBroadcasting.com. And Alan, where can people find you on the Twitter? Uh, Twitter.com/slash Alan Jude. That is amazing, and I am Twitter.com/slash Chris L A S. And before I wrap up. I will channel Brian for a moment, and I don't know how long this is going on, but I think it's going on right now. If uh, you go over to uh, RadicalBreeze.com, the B-Man is having a set-your-own-price on Illumination Software Creator this week, and uh, he has the new 4.0 version coming out soon, and I think if you get in with the set-your-own-price, you get the upgrade to the 4.0 version for free. If I'm wrong about that, he'll at least give you a plate of hot, delicious chocolate chip cookies with a delicious side of organic milk. And he'll mail that to you. If I'm wrong. If I'm right, you just get 4.0 for free. So that's win-win, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. uh, those of you who follow us on Twitter will get the, uh, the cookies reference. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. And we'll see you next week.
That's a lot of white. I gotta say, that's a lot of white. Okay, here we go. Coming up on this week's episode of the Linux Action Show, we'll show you how you can save hundreds of dollars by no longer burning those CDs and instead using some USB media with UNet Booten. Plus, find out why Microsoft is the, well, at least one of the top code contributors to the Linux 3.0 kernel and why that's really not that big of a deal. All that and more on this week's episode of the Linux Action Show.